Hello, I am Marilyn Kaltenborn, and today, May 23rd, 2013, 2012, I am going to talk to Justice Belfield about his days in the United States Army during World War II. In April of this year, I interviewed Mr. Belfield about his years in the United States Cavalry. Once again, we are at the studio of our local public access TV station. It is located in the Bethlehem Public Library, town of Bethlehem in Del Mar, New York. I would like to thank Janice Irwin, who is here today, assisting us with operating the camera and giving us other technical assistance. As I mentioned in our last interview, Mr. Belfield lives in Glenmont, New York with his wife of 70 years. I met Mr. Belfield this past January. We both volunteer at an after school program for children in grades six through 12. Mr. Belfield, is it okay to call you Jay? Love it. For those who missed our last interview, when were you born and where were you born? June 27, 1916 in Eureka, New York. And last month, we learned that you joined the United States Cavalry in 1936 when you were 19 years old, and you were honorably discharged in 1940. When they took the horses away. And then on December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Soon after that, you, like many men in the United States, received a draft notice. After receiving this notice, you told me that you enlisted in the Army and were put in the reserves for about one year. During the one-year wait, what division were you assigned to? I was assigned to the 17th Armored Division. But when I got my orders, I was ordered to the 22nd Armored Division. But it, we're missing one thing here. I was married in the meantime. Oh, that's right. That's right. To Lillian. Yes. And um, what uh, <laughs> camps were you assigned to by the military when you were finally assigned to active duty? I was assigned to Fort, Ni Fort, Ni uh, Fort Ni Niagara, New York. And from Fort Niagara, New York, to Camp Perry, Ohio, and from Camp Perry, Ohio, to Camp Campbell, Kentucky, Camp Campbell, Kentucky, to Fort Knox, Kentucky. There I was a teacher to the ARTC, Armored, Armored Replacement Training Center, teaching the young men there about weapons. And how did you know so much about weapons? because I had worked for the Savage Arms in Utica on uh, the Tommy Thompson submachine gun, Tommy, the Tommy gun they call it, and the caliber 50, caliber 30, air-cooled, and the water-cooled models are the same, and uh, shotguns, rifles and whatever it came through at that time. My goodness. Then in 1944, you were sent to Fort McPherson, Georgia. Tell us about your experiences watching civilians prepare the rifles and other weapons that were going to be used in the war effort. Well, this, this has an, an, a few peculiarities to it. Uh, I was... Uh, my unit, my men, that is to say, uh, and I were chosen as uh, what they call IDs, Inspector IG. Hey, I'm getting it wrong here. You Inspector, were Inspector General's Inspector General's uh, inspection, and. Uh, we did it at at uh, Fort McPherson. No, Fort at at Camp Gordon, uh, Fort Gordon, Camp Gordon at that time, and uh, they picked us to go to uh, Fort McPherson, where they seemed to be having a little trouble, and uh, they asked me if I'd go. So 
Oh, I said, sure. And uh, I went, I was a, by the way, at that time I was a corporal. And uh, the other men were sergeants. So it, it, uh, corporal, sergeant, all that meant was money to me. And uh, so we went, we went there and we watched them blew the M1 rifle. Well, it took me about 15 minutes to watch them do the M1 rifle. I said, this is not the way you do blue, blue any, any weapon. So I went in and told the officer in charge that uh, they weren't doing it right. He said, oh, yes, they are. I said, no, they're not. He said, well, how do you know so much about it? So I explained to him I worked where they made the weapons. And I'd seen much, much brewing. And... Uh, he uh, said to me, well, he says, you go out back where you are and mind your own business. So I went back out, minded my own business. I didn't tell him anymore. So things went along fine. We, we went home. I turned in my report. I reported the fact that, I, that they were doing, doing the brewing wrong, uh, but no, nothing ever came of it. And then we, I was assigned to uh, inspect the 7, 70, 71st Infantry Division uh, weapons uh, through, their, through their IG inspection. And they passed it with flying colors, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful weapons. They did, there was, I couldn't find anything wrong. And I say I couldn't find it. My men and I couldn't find anything. And uh, I want to take all the credit. Uh, and then we went to the 10th Armored Division. Well, we went in the first uh, supply room and started checking their, checking their M1 rifles. I, I, of course, was standing up in the front watching, watching them do it. One of my men come up and said, this is no good. He said, why? I said, why? He says, because all the springs have, have carburized, uh, carburized. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, he said, you pull them back and they don't, they don't go back where they're supposed to. And uh, he says, oh, the rear sight uh, cover is also a spring tight uh, affair. And you pull it back and you pull it back hard enough and the back, uh, uh, me, uh, the uh, rear sight falls off. <laughs> so I said, well, I said, are they all like that? And he said, yeah, well, all that we've looked at so far. So we, we blew, red tagged everything, and, uh, the uh, rifles. And then he went on to the machine guns. The machine guns were no good either. They didn't even bother to take them apart. They didn't. You can't do that. And uh, they did all the machine guns and did uh, rifles. And uh, the, the hand weapons, all, all of them were no good. So rejected the works. Went on to the next one. Same thing. I went on to the third one. And we were just in about, it takes a time to get set up before you can do it. And I was setting up and going, getting, getting ready. And all of a sudden, we, I had to take, take an officer from, with me. You know, the poor, poor guy, he didn't have anything else to do. So he came with me and uh, he uh, was supposed to make a report. And I see him go whew, like a shot out of a gun, head for the door. And... I see him he give the high ball. There must, there must be something going on. So he comes over to me. He says, Sergeant, they, you, they want you at the front door. So I went up the front door, and there's a two-star general. Woo-hoo-hoo. -hoo. I'm, I'm in big company. And uh, the, uh, the, ten, the, armor in uh, the, the uh, general in charge of the 
10 time of division. He says, uh, who's in charge here? I said, I am, sir. And he says, uh, what are you finding? I told him, well, all your weapons fail, fail inspection. He says, all of them? I said, well, I said, I've only done two companies and I'm on the third one. Yes, it's going to, do, it's going to fail too. I said, I think all your companies are going to, going, going to fail. All your weapons are going to fail. Oh, he said, oh my God, we're scheduled to go over, go to Europe in X number of time, days. I don't know how, anymore. And uh, you can't, I said, you can't go anywhere. You don't have any weapons. Well, he says, okay, Sergeant, thank you a million. He thanked me. And he asked me my name and what my uh, unit was my commanding officer, and I, I thought that was the end of it. But anyway, we, he said, don't do any more. He says, my ordnance company will take it from here. So uh, that was the, I thought that was the end of, the end of it. Well, about uh, two weeks go by, and the, uh, my captain falls a company out, and he he says, I have something here I have to read to you. And he read, read a, a letter from the commanding general commending me and my men for the wonderful job we had done. If, he had, if that had only been a few days later, they would have been in Europe and they wouldn't have had a doggone thing to, to, to use for the war. The Tenth Armored was right in the right in the, the thick of it. They, in fact, they were with good old General Patton. So uh, I, that's, I, I got rid of that uh, and went back went back to uh, Gordon and, and I was corporal when I went uh, over there. I came back and I got my uh, Paraphernalia, you had to keep it in the uh, supply room where you're gone, so nobody steal it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, I took it all back, two big bags full. I could sling them over my shoulder. And the supply sergeant says, "Hey, wait a minute! I think I got something here for you." So I said, "Well, what what do you mean?" He says, "I'll show you in a second. Takes these two big bundles of, of severns and sits them on, the, on there. Says, "Get these on as fast as you can." I said, "What?" I said, "I ain't that. Uh, uh, I uh, bigger sergeant yet. I got to go through." No, he says one one shot. And you're going to get a five star, five stripes. Oh, I was thinking, money, 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 money. <laughs> it worked. I I got my five stripes and I was in, I I had nine all of those nine men that worked for me. Now they were officially some of the sergeants were now all under me officially. Very nice, Jay. Yeah. Well, the officer at. Fort McPherson, hey, if he had been a nice man, he wouldn't have gotten in trouble. So <laughs> evidently he got in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and all of his weapons were rejected by you. Isn't that interesting? And I, I didn't know they were 10th Armored Division. That's right. <laughs> I didn't know whose, whose weapons they were. But lucky I caught them. Very lucky. Uh, anybody very, very else lucky. would uh, know that. Right, right. See? And uh, the good Lord knows what he's doing. I don't, but he does. And uh, so that's my, that's how I got to be a five striper. Now, when you were at um, Camp Gordon, I believe you uh, taught yourself French. I started to teach yourself French. I got, in fact, I got the book home right now. You knew some German because your grandparents spoke German. Yes. And then because you were going to Europe, 
you thought it was a good idea to also learn French. That was one of the smartest moves I ever made. So then you could talk to as many Europeans as possible. That was your goal. We were only there, well, I got to tell you, yes. Well, go ahead. Okay. Then uh, you eventually received your orders to go to Belgium, and you departed from the harbor we, in New we, York. Yes. And well, we didn't, know we, were, we, were, we didn't know we were going to Belgium. Oh, you didn't. You just knew. We knew we were going to Europe. Europe. And so tell us about the ship you were on to go to Europe. I was, I was, had the privilege of being on the last wooden transport afloat, USAT Born Quinn. It was re, uh, decommissioned after it came back to the United States from Denver to South in France. I met at those guys <laughs> yet today. <laughs> Because <laughs> they dump me off and I can't walk on water, right? Jesus. <laughs> so I, I, I was hooked. So your ship was in the middle of a large convoy? It was in, they, because it was wood, they placed it in the middle of a 150 ship convoy. And we had little corvettes around us. And on your. And then destroyers were back of them. Uh huh. Yeah. And on your way over, did you s see any enemy uh, ships or anything? Tell us about that. We, we had two uh, uh, submarine attacks on the way over. But those corvettes and, and destroyers made short work of them. And the only reason, how, the only way we knew that they had done away with them Big oil sticks, uh, stick, uh, slicks on the top of the water, right in front of us. We had to go through the oil slick and hmm. started going, or going uh, ahead. Yeah. And then you landed in um, Portsmouth, Southampton. Hampton. And uh, explain what it was like to go into that port. Oh, uh, Portsmouth, Southampton is a port. You can go, go to your right. You go into uh, Southampton. You go to your left. You go to Portsmouth. Inside them, there's a, a giant. They had a giant uh, submarine net along uh, over the opening. There was a, a big opening, and they had uh, tugboats open the open it up for you to come come in. But they also had uh, gunships there. If, if if a submarine tried to go through, goodbye submarine, and. We got in, there's probably five, five ships went through the uh, net, and we stayed there overnight. And then the next day, you went to La Havre, France? The next day, we, well, La Havre is just across from Southampton and Portsmouth. And uh, the next day, uh, they opened the submarine net, and they had a whole line of I don't know whether they were cruisers or whether they were battleships or what they were. I, I'm not that familiar with the Navy. But they were big ships all the way across. These space uh, 100 yards apart, I'd say, all the way across. Well, we got almost into, into La Har Harbor, and uh, there's a, four, four sailors on a on a, plant, on a Oh, what we, planks, you know, mm -hmm. put together. And uh, they had a little white flag on it, and they were waiting to us to go and get them. And uh, our, our captain said, no, don't pull out a line. Don't pull out a line. He told the uh, horrors, you know, steering our ship. So the, the one in front of us, Saw them too. Well, he went across over over toward the toward the toward the, the, the men who were waving. Yeah, and they almost got there, and all of a sudden, it got flung. The whole tail end of the ship <laughs> flew off. My goodness. Yep, and she, she started to go down right away, of course, and. 
the uh, the two tugboats came out, came out quickly. He had a, uh, one of the biggest rope I ever saw. It was about that big around. And he slung it out on the back of that ship and got it in on uh, dry, uh, dry, so it was wow. all, yeah, it just pushing in, that's all. My goodness, that was close. <laughs> I watched it. I watched stand on deck watching the whole, the whole affair. Now, tell the audience about the um, two times you were involved with trains that had Nazi sympathizers involved. Okay, okay. So we got we finally got out into La Hire. It was cold as winter. We had each man had two two big uh, bags of bag of equipment, his rifle, and so forth, carbine. I had a carbine, and uh, we waited and we waited and we waited. Nothing happened. So our uh, uh, captain says, "See those bo trucks over there? Go over and get on those trucks." He says, okay. So we got on board the trucks and we went into uh, St. Valerie, which is only a short distance away, by the way. And uh, fake camp in St. Valerie. And uh, we got in there okay on the trucks. But except our, they had put up pup tents for us already. And probably two two feet of snow underneath. I I don't know. I, I, I feared the pub, uh, the uh, uh, tent pegs were going to hold hold it, but they did, evidently. And uh, they open up the t tent, and there there's two feet of snow inside of it. So my friend Joe, my buddy, he's also a sergeant. He came from Buffalo, by the way. And uh, he said, "Wait, well, what are we going to do, Jay? I said, I'll show you. So I said, you got a shovel? He says, yeah, I got a shovel. So he got a shovel. He had a shovel. So we got, got the shovel and we started digging and digging and digging. We did a big hole. So put his, put his blanket in the hole and put my blanket over. Uh, well, first we put our uh, shelter half, mm -hmm. shelter half down, then the, then the blanket. Then over the top of us, another blanket, another shoulder hat. So, got in and warm as toast. Well, Joe and I get in at night, everybody else is wondering how they're going to get in their tent. I, I ain't telling nobody. <laughs> they come and look and see, and they say, gee, boy, you guys are smart. So they begin to do the same thing. <laughs> About, oh, I'd say well past midnight, maybe two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I thought, oh, how broke loose. I thought they were moving it from one place to another. Sirens all over the place. I never heard such an uproar in my life. And I got up and went out to look and see what had happened. We were right next door to a, a hospital unit and they were coming in with these uh, uh, ambulances, two men, to a ram ambulance, of course, it's all they could get in one. Right. And uh, <clears throat> this one goes to this tent, this one goes to that tent, this one goes to that one way over there, and so forth. And they were d directing them. He said, he said uh, the officer in charge was a major, and he said, uh, would you men, men please ha give us a hand? And I said, sure, I'll, I'll give you a hand. He said, can you get any more? I said, Give me 10 minutes and I'll get, get a half a dozen more. Said, okay. So I kind of went down and got my men, came up, and uh, we're helping them c carry the uh, uh, stretchers, the injured, where, right. stretchers, wherever they want them. And uh, my captain, my old man, he came over and he says, What are you? I'm going to clean it up a little bit. Uh, the, what are you doing with these guys? You know that's not your. You're not supposed to be over there. You're supposed to be over there. I said. I said that. There's a need for help here to help unload these ambulances. I said, and I, uh, the officer in charge said he needed help, and I went and gave it to him. 
And uh, he says, get back over and not 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 nicely. A few other words in there. Get all back over where you belong. Uh, at that time, the major came by and he said, "What's going on here?" And I told him, uh, and he said, "You you keep doing what you're doing." He went over to the captain. And he says, "Captain, you mind your own business. You get get back." <laughs> And he didn't use any flowery language either. Get back where you belong. He says, yeah, I'll turn them loose when I get ready. Well, we stayed there all night and helped him out. Come to find out the more early morning, the, the first thing we do, find out there was a train wreck at night. The train was uh, operated by a engineer that was a, a German collaborator. And he ran into the station. He ran, he ran, when he opened up near the station, he opened up everything and kaboom, ran right into it. And, but that ain't the, that ain't the interesting part of this story. The guys who were in the front that got killed and stuff took our place they were supposed to be on the trucks, and we were supposed to be there. Wow, Jay. You say, the good Lord didn't have his finger on me? Hey, all the way. No. And uh, from that day on, I was, I, I was in, in, good, <laughs> in good relations with, with the captain. <laughs> he, no. didn't, he didn't like me from that <laughs> Now, Jay, we're uh, nearly out of time today. So we have to thank uh, Janice and the Bethlehem television uh, system for letting us interview, letting me interview you today. And maybe we can come back to hear more of your stories. Uh, well, about we've World only, only just begun. I know that, Jay. <laughs> this is very interesting. Yeah, we've only just begun. The Second part of the second part of it uh, is more interest, uh, just as interesting because it starts out with a train train ride <laughs> too. <laughs> but yes, uh, we can we can take it up. We again. can come back again. Well, I have to have my paper so I can rehearse a little bit. So that concludes our show.